Hello everybody. Hope you guys are enjoying the conference so far, isn't it? Good. So <clears throat> my topic is let's go serverless at the edge. Too confusing word here, and uh, I'll try to explain what is serverless and why to go serverless at the edge. And before start, thank you so much, guys, for staying so late for this session, and thanks to DevNet for arranging this session. <clears throat> so guys, my session is organized mainly in four sections. First, I'll talk about serverless, and then edge computing, and how we can do serverless at the edge. Com edge. And finally, why serverless uh, at the edge, and why now? So <clears throat> let's start. So guys, this is me, Arvind Tiwari. I work for CTO Cloud Services in Cisco Systems, and uh, I've been uh, doing uh, open, open source contribution for a long time. And uh, I did a lot of contribution in OpenStack. The, I mean, anybody who knows OpenStack here, there are, these are pretty important uh, uh, projects uh, in the OpenStack community, Keystone, Barbican. Especially Marshall, uh, we have uh, developed the entire uh, service and contributed to the OpenStack, and that is more into the space of uh, data security at rest. Anybody, if you want, like, uh, maybe you can uh, look into it. And I'm also uh, active in uh, uh, Cloud Security Alliance. And last year, uh, we have started a working group on blockchain. So I'm, I like blockchain, and I'm also active there. This is my Twitter handle. If you guys want to connect, I'll be happy to. So let's start, guys, serverless. So, so OK, so let me uh, give you one. Uh, Sorry, um, I started my uh, career in cloud around nine years before as a developer in cloud, right? And uh, <clears throat> that was the time when uh, very few people, few people know about cloud, what exactly it is. And whenever somebody asks uh, to me, like, okay, what it is, I try to explain them, but it is confusing, guys. It's still, it is confusing for a lot of people. So to get rid, uh, I. I used to uh, say that it is cutting edge technology. And I think with the serverless, I think we, we have the same situation. Serverless is cutting edge technology, indeed it is. And the reason is, I mean, a lot of people try to learn it, understand it, and integrate this technology with their current application. And providers are, I mean, it started by AWS. Uh, Lambda is the well-known uh, platform for serverless, right? <clears throat> And everybody is behind it. So let's talk about it, what it is. So guys, to understand serverless, I think we need to understand the evolution of less. Why less, right? Everybody is trying to do less and try to get more, right? And I haven't find people who say, OK, I want to do more, but try to get less, right? And uh, <clears throat> this is the statement most innovations or innovations are to do less or to make things more efficient. And I'll try to prove this point with, uh, <clears throat> uh, we need to go a little bit back. So guys, we started with uh, uh, sedan chair and to move one person or thing from one place to other place. We have this big uh, sedan chair and there are a lot of people uh, required to hold that. So we need a lot of human power to hold that. Then we invented the wheel, right? And then we integrated the wheel with the, with the, the, with the chair, pull, uh, pull of briksha, right? And what we got is one person can pull the, that workload, or even bigger workload, right? And later, we integrated those, uh, that use case with animal. And what we achieved is even there is no human, but we can uh, achieve more. We can just uh, Harness the animal and just uh, steer the animal. We can go far. We can do. do we can move even bigger workload. And finally, guys, we invented the engine, and we integrated with this kind of cart, and we got even more. Right. So, point here. What I want what, uh, try to make here is, in every invention, we try to remove something. We try to do less. Basically, we try to remove the human effort. And we try to make uh, things more efficient so that we can get more out of less. So next, think about the boat, right? 
boat itself is a great invention. If you want to travel on, on um, water, you need something like this. But we started with uh, pedal board rowing, and uh, that was a great thing. But it is a lot of uh, human intensive thing. I mean, if you have to go far, and you need a bigger board, you need a lot of people to row, right? Then we invented the sail, guys. So sail is a great invention which totally abstracted the uh, uh, paddle. And uh, it takes us to long destinations. Think about it like uh, <clears throat> uh, how much Christopher Columbus would have explored with the paddle boat. They had the sail boat, right? And later we found the, again the engine, maybe coal powered engine, and we integrated with big ship. And we started uh, traveling way far than sailboat. And finally, got, we got the more efficient engine and more efficient uh, ships, right? So again, the same point, guys. I mean, whenever we in, uh, invent or innovate, the main reason is to do something less, something we want to abstract, or to make things more efficient, right? <clears throat> Let's come to the modern age. We are talking about driverless car or pilotless uh, uh, aircraft. So what we are try basically doing, and this car is there standing downstairs, okay? So uh, what we are trying to do is basically artificial intelligence and AI or robotics technology. Basically, we are, we are trying to remove human from the equation. We, we are totally trying to remove the human, right? It's pure, nobody is there. But you, you can sit there, but you don't need to drive the car. And we are also removing the intelligence. When you drive your car, you need some, some intelligence to make the right decision, right? <clears throat> so now, basically, we are inventing, we are, we are inventing to remove the human from the equation, and we are removing the intelligence uh, as well, right? Think about the robotics. Basically, what it brought, it's a great invention, right? And uh, wherever we cannot deploy human because of some situation where we cannot deploy human, robots are the thing. Or in like uh, manufacturing unit, assembly line, right? It was, uh, uh, it was the human thing. And we replaced those uh, <coughs> use cases with a robot to make it more efficient. And finally, guys, um, in medical sciences, right? Nowadays, a doctor sitting thousands of miles away from the patient, they can, they can do some uh, surgery, right? So we are inventing to do less and achieve more. <clears throat> Last example, guys, in FinTech. This is the, I mean, everybody uh, understand what it is, right? So cryptocurrencies or blockchain are really, really great invention, right? And uh, what, I mean, to, to save your money, we, we, we trust on bank, right? We put our money on the bank and we trust on the, on the, the employee of the bank. They manage our, our, our money, right? But that, there are many use cases where that trust has been breached. And recently, a very good, good example in India, uh, <coughs> there's a bank called Punjab National Bank. Few employees basically just breached the, the trust and uh, um, there has been big uh, issue happening there right now. So what this technology bring, basically it removed the trust. It's a trustless, nobody, we don't trust people anymore. The technology basically enforces the trust. Nobody can breach their technology. It is less time to the uh, uh, transaction time. So even now, if you have to send some money uh, to China or anywhere else, it takes three days at least to, to, uh, to reach the money, right? So this is the technology which I remove the time, it, it takes only hardly a minute or so to do that. It's boundaryless, bankless, there is a lot of less here. So guys, point what I want to make here is, we are inventing to abstract something, and we are abstracting something to, to make more efficient and to do more. <clears throat> so why less, why we are trying to do it, right? So basically less gives us uh, <clears throat> less human effort, less intelligence, uh, less cost effective, sorry, more cost effective, uh, less risk and uh, ti less time to market, less resistance and chaos, right? And think about it, hundreds of people are just rowing the boat, right? It's chaotic. 
It is going to provide more productivity, efficiency, scalability, and freedom and reach. <clears throat> Good guys. So let's get back to the technical serverless uh, topic. And uh, <clears throat> so this is the definition which I picked from one of the website. And uh, Mark, uh, Mike Robert has done the really great job. So serverless architecture refers to the applications that significantly depend on the third-party services known as BAS, or on custom code that run on ephemeral containers, uh, known as function as service or FAS. So Essentially, there are two categories of serverless. One is BAS and other is FAST. So let's, let's talk about the BAS. So let's go back around 15 years ago when uh, we started developing application. I mean, at least I started that way. And uh, I was a developer there. So everybody, there are multiple developers, right? We write code and then we build uh, <coughs> uh, the deployable unit, and then we talk to the DevOps, and DevOps talk to the infrastructure, and they deploy it. So that, that was the, the common pattern there. An important thing was when person like me or a particular individual, if we have any great idea, we think that, okay, we can, we can uh, have an application out of that idea. The biggest resistance was you have to buy a lot of hardware, a lot of infrastructure, Second thing is to manage those infrastructure, you have to buy <clears throat> a lot of humans, right? And then you need people to develop your software, and then you need people to, to deploy and manage that software. Those are like obstacles. So there were th generally three types of people in the software, like dev, ops, and infrastructure people, right? So that is, I mean, if you want to do that, yes, you can do it. You have to invest a lot of money, and it is risky. I mean, not all ideas get successful, right? If you fail, you have to look for the Craigslist to sell, sell your hardware, right? <clears throat> so that, now, with the, with the advancement in the cloud technology, even we can think about, like a normal individual, right? We can think about having and uh, deploying, uh, 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 building the application based on our, our ideas. And uh, what we do is we basically rely on the cloud provider and we take all the services, for example, services like authentication service, and uh, <clears throat> uh, in case of platform, like database or uh, load balancer, and infrastructure, we always rely on the cloud provider, okay? So, and, and we build application or services which basically integrate with, uh, uh, with those services, and uh, directly or indirectly they use those infrastructure. But important thing is, we are not managing those services, we are not managing those hardware, right? And if you are, you are outsourcing those component of your application, so that is the uh, uh, serverless. One form of serverless, which is BAS. And uh, second is FAST, function as a service. And function as a service is essentially, okay, so let's get back again. Like we have to deploy, I mean, we have to build application, we, we build the jar file or war file, and then we deploy it, right? So it's a pretty big monolithic piece of software, right? With the FAST, it's on-event ephemeral compute. What essentially you do, you write a code, bare minimum code, and it is like uh, relative what is going to be in function. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. But essentially, you write function, which is pick your uh, language. Maybe you can use Python or Node.js or Go, whatever. But you write a very small piece of software in one file or a couple of files, and then you throw on, on, the, on the platform, which support the function as service. And your pl platform is going to take care of like, how it is going to deploy when the event occur, right? How it is going to, whether it's going to use containers or virtual machine, that is totally abstracted from you. Code is everything. So no jar, no war, nothing, no container. It's simple code. You deploy it, your platform is going to manage it, version it, whatever, it's code. Code is the primary citizen of, uh, for the FAST. And finally, guys, it is developer friendly. As I mentioned, like 15 years before, we have to work with uh, uh, dev, uh, sorry, ops, and then infra infrastructure people. Later, there is there are some people uh, uh, called DevOps. They know about um, dev as well as the ops thing, 
thing, right? They also have some understanding of the infra infrastructure. So with this technology, it's more developer friendly because you don't have to worry about the ops, you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. You just write code, you write code with your business logic and just deploy it on the platform. <clears throat> So as our application architecture evolve from monolithic to entire and to microservices, our need for uh, infrastructure management changed, right? So we started with monolithic application and that was the time when we buy hardware. We means the enterprises who are rich enough to buy uh, those uh, uh, hardware. And uh, we glued them with the wiring and everything, right? So everything was done by the human. Right, there was a lot of people involved in the infrastructure and the ops and the dev. So with the invent of cloud technology like OpenStack or VMware, all we do is we throw some hardware and then put a virtualization layer on top of it, which is OpenStack, which gives you the API to manage your hardware. Okay, even, I mean, as a, as a so instead of having 10 or 20 people managing your, your infrastructure, you are, uh, you are one or two people who are going to use the APIs or interface of the, those uh, <coughs> uh, OpenStack or VM to manage and build your infrastructure. Even you can use the scripting language like Ansible and um, uh, Terraform to just define your infrastructure as a code and do it again and again. And later when co containers arise, so there are other uh, uh, orchestration uh, 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 tool we got like Mesosphere or container, uh, Kubernetes. So what essentially it does is, it is more easier than uh, open stack way of doing thing. You don't have to worry about, you just write the code, package it in the container, and throw it in the Kubernetes. <coughs> Finally guys, with the function that is much, much easier, you don't have to worry about the container or anything. You just write code, put it on the uh, uh, platform, and platform is going to take care of everything. <coughs> Everything means how it is going to uh, invoke uh, uh, when. So guys, as I mentioned, function is a bare minimum code. So this is how your hello world function would look like in a particular platform. And this is how, what you're going to write if you have to write the hello world, right? And uh, you throw that code on the platform, which is uh, function as a service platform, and uh, then your platform is going to provide integration capabilities with the ecosystem component. For example, you can integrate your code with a MongoDB insert, or you can integrate your, your function, basically let's call it function, not code. You integrate your function with a, with, a, with a messaging system like Kafka. Even if you want that, okay, my function, I want to use a REST uh, interface to access my function, so you, you define uh, REST. So, and also you can define that, okay, if I'm posting an image on, on a particular object store, I want to trigger my function. That is what is called triggers, right? <clears throat> and those ecosystem components are external, but integration will be provided by the function as a service platform. Finally, function as, function as a service is designed for the stateless workloads, but not, I mean, in a modern age, there's, I mean, nobody's writing hello world. Everybody writes something so that they process it and they store it. So, I mean, this platform also provides you ability to uh, talk to the uh, uh, database so that you can store it and uh, retrieve some data when you're uh, <coughs> yeah, spinning up the process. Okay, guys, so now let's talk about serverless, what we got with the technical thing of serverless, right? So less labor cost, guys. I already explained, you don't have to manage a lot of servers or you don't have to, you, know, you don't need people to manage server and ops people, right? That is big cost saving. You are not going to buy infrastructure. That is a really big cost saving, guys. And uh, less risky in the sense, if you fail, it's okay. You don't have to look for the cra Craigslist. Less time to the market. If you have any idea, you can, uh, uh, you can talk to some developer and just build it, start with the POC, talk to your investor, and then if your uh, idea really uh, uh, flies, so you can scale your, your application, right? And uh, if not, then okay, you just walk away. <clears throat> it gives you agility, flexibility, and scalability, right? And uh, 
last point is really important uh, efficient resource utilization guys so there are two aspects of serverless right and let's focus on the function as a service so think about it guys as a developer i don't have to manage anything and with the function as a service because it is ephemeral, I'm going to pay only for the fraction of second, fraction of time when my function is executed, right? When executing. So it's a huge cost, cost saving. And my finance is also happy, guys. So I used to pay 1000 bucks, and now I'm paying just 10 bucks or 20 bucks, right? Great thing. Other aspect, guys. So think about like cloud provider, right? Provide, who, a, pro, a provider who is providing the platform, right? So. I mean, as a cloud provider, my job is to provide you infrastructure, for example, and I'll get paid for it, right? If I'm go giving you virtual machine or hardware or whatever, as a, as a, as a cloud, I'll, I'll get paid for it. Then why I'm, I'm going to support function as a service, guys? The reason is managing hardware or infrastructure is not easy. It's complex. Okay, you are not managing it, but as a cloud provider, I have to manage it. I have need resources to manage it. I need people to, to do all the things, right? So why not less servers? So function as service give ability, ability to the cloud provider to do more with the same, same hardware, right? So you have 10 hardware and you are supporting function, so you're you are basically using the same pool of hardware to, uh, to run function from different tenants, right? So basically, you're doing more with the less resources. Make sense, guys? <clears throat> okay, so every technology has some limitation and uh, uh, serverless is not the exception. And from here onward, we are going to more focus on the fast aspect of the serverless. <clears throat> so guys, uh, <clears throat> Number one thing is state management because it is ephemeral. We are not keeping the connection from the database or anything. When, we, when, when, when it goes down, we kill all the connection. So there is latency there, right? When we, when we got the trigger, we have to bring up the process. We have to establish the connection from the, from the databases or the external ecosystem component. Testing is not easy because <clears throat> It is ephemeral and it is somewhere running at the cloud provider. It's not that easy. You don't have much control, right? Because uh, it is the third party uh, uh, infrastructure. And again, when it comes to the serverless, or fast, it's ephemeral. So guys, last point is security. It is debatable, right? And there are a lot of debate going on uh, about security of serverless and uh, especially, specifically function. And being an optimistic person, I think security-wise, it is good. So first of all, uh, outsource servers less for you to secure, right? I'm not saying we cannot do that, right? But everything need cost. So you can buy server, you can put a lot of technical uh, 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 human uh, there so that they can secure. We are not talking about the physical security of hardware. We are talking about the, the, <clears throat> the people who can hack your hardware, uh, hardware and do bad with thing, right? That's why we need to have right patching, right security uh, patch install. If there is any vulnerability, we need to fix those things, right? And I mean, we can do it, but we need to put a lot of money for that. So. Cloud provider, which is, uh, I mean, it is assumed that cloud provider is going to do a be better job because that is their bread and butter, right? And if you guys are interested, uh, in a CSA community, there is a, there is a, a very good uh, document called uh, CCM, Cisco, oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Cloud Control Metrics. And that is a really good uh, piece of document which will give you like what you expect from the cloud provider for a particular use case, right? I would uh, strongly recommend you guys. And uh, <clears throat> ephemeral processes are harder to hack. So think about it, you have, I mean, I'm talking about the function, right? Function are ephemeral, right? It goes up, process it, goes down. So in a traditional process, you bring it up and keep it running, whether somebody is using it or not. So it has 24 hour uh, uh, exposure to the hack, right? You have endpoint. And finally, guys, better uh, workload isolation. 
So for with the virtual machine or containers, there was a big uh, debate that, okay, your virtual machine, I mean, let's say you have multiple tenants virtual machine running on the same hardware. So basically they are, they are <coughs> uh, sharing the, the libraries and, and the hardware, right? And same with, I mean, containers solve those problems with the namespaces and C groups, but it's still it is using the same hardware. And isolation, workload isolation was always a question. Whenever you talk about security on cloud, the isolation is one thing. So I think its uh, functions are better because these are ephemeral. When you, I mean, one function goes down and, and then it leaves everything away. And so the point what I'm, uh, I'm trying to make here is you can use the same hardware to run function from the, from, from the multiple tenants, okay? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So basically, when you, you, you uh, no, no, no. Well, yeah. So point what I'm trying to make here is, let's say you have a process which is running and it is accessible through the endpoint, right? And that endpoint is on for 24, 24 by seven. So it has more exposure to hack, right? Okay. Let's talk about the edge and uh, what is edge computing? What, why we are doing it? <laughs> So guys, edge is again a confusing term, and uh, it has it has a relative meaning, right? It is depending on which context we are what, what context we are take, uh, talking about. So number one is uh, service provider. So service provider, think about our service provider, cell phone service provider. So I mean, there are a lot of uh, <coughs> mobile uh, uh, towers around on the cities, right? So the, our our cell phone basically talk to those towers. Whenever we move, it talk to the uh, those tower. Basically, that is the network between the. So that is the edge for uh, service providers. And guys, those towers are just not the network hubs, but there is fair amount of computing going on. And uh, these are the example like uh, <coughs> voice recognition. And uh, so think about it like if you want to ask something from Siri and Siri is waiting for one, one minute, right? So we, we are doing those uh, uh, computing closer to your device because to give a better experience, right? Driverless car, think about it like driverless car is mainly depending on the network technology, right? If for any information your car need and it is going to talk to the cloud because of the latency, right, delay, it is going to get information very late, right? So these are the, the edge or the network tower where a lot of comp computing is going to happen or it's happening. And uh, video optimization, CDN or CDN is, so there's a lot of use cases where we are using this, uh, we are doing the computing at this type of edge. Manufacturing assembly line, guys, I mentioned that this is the you, uh, the plant, it used to be run by the human, right? We, there are a lot of women, uh, they basically do one thing at a time and then pass on to the next people, right? So good thing was, I mean, I mean, if somebody has to propagate the data or any information to the next level, right, you can talk, right? And, uh, <clears throat> but humans are not designed to do work in synchronization for a long time maybe half an hour or hour, but, so that's why we replace human with the, with, the, with the robots, right? And robots are very good, they can work in synchronization for, for days, right? But it's still, data or the information, like one robot is processing, doing something and generated some data, that data need to be processed and converted into the information so that next process which is waiting for the data should get it, right? That's why we need to process some of the data right there. And that is the edge computing for this uh, scenario, okay? And there are many use cases, and number one thing is better uh, efficient human performance, better product quality, a lot of things are there, okay? <clears throat> Finally, guys, uh, um, smart city. So, I mean, everybody is talking about the smart city, and there are a lot of solutions available there. But essentially what we are doing is there are a lot of 
uh, data we are uh, generating from the from the different use cases, right? We are uh, generating data from the sensor and cameras, and that need to be processed right there, right? And uh, <clears throat> and smart city is a really big use case. And let's take an example like uh, 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 effective mo mobility solution, public transportation. H have anybody uh, know this? Uh, here comes the bus. Okay, so I am from North Carolina. Since last year, whenever I have to drop my son uh, to this uh, school bus, uh, school, uh, bus stop, so we have to have we have to take a good amount of time so that sometime like your bus got delayed or get early, right? So we have to be there maybe 15 or 20 minutes before. So this is a really cool technology, and that is one of the example of IoT. So guys, with a with a with a cell phone and sensor technology basically whenever your bus is uh, around uh, two miles or closer to your stop you got notified and you just walk to the uh, 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 bus stop right so there are many other use cases like uh, uh, alerting notification city management and uh, better traffic management reducing so all these use cases are driven by the the edge computing right <coughs> And uh, this is a very common use case, uh, smart home. And everybody know what, what we are doing, but for sake of example, uh, talk about, let's talk about the Nest devices, okay? So Nest devices are not dumb device, guys. So we are, we are doing fair amount of computing there. So what we do is we go to the uh, Nest interface, we define our policy that, okay, in this particular room, I need my temperature to be a certain level, and uh, otherwise just kick in the, the, the cooling, right? And then, you, when that policy will be downloaded at the device, and your, I mean, that Nest device, and you, uh, your device basically, based on the external event, maybe temperature or whatever, it kicks your, your, your uh, cooling and heating system. And uh, your, your car, your car itself is an edge environment, right? Your car is generating a lot of data. There are a lot of data you need to process right there. And for example, guys, Let's say you are driving and you are taking, uh, you are changing the lane, and at the blind spot there is a car. So that is the event, right? We have to process it right there, and so we, we we should not notify the driver, right? And uh, <clears throat> uh, automatic brake, and uh, um, there are many use cases uh, in the in the in the automobile which need computing right there. Finally, agriculture, and um, again, uh, this is a. A uh, great example of edge computing where we are generating a lot of data from the field and we are doing some analysis and uh, based on that data. So we need a edge computing there. And uh, this is a very common use case. I'm not going to talk about it. Finally, guys, there is one field. So far, uh, we thought that edge computing is about collecting data, cleaning them, data, and then uh, uh, aggregating it and sending it to the cloud. But that is not true anymore. It's not, I mean, that we are doing it still, but edge analytics is the use case. For example, our um, agriculture, where we need to process that data and generate the analysis of that so that we can take, we can react on those data. <clears throat> Finally, okay, why edge computing? Why we are doing it? So, as I mentioned, like better quality and experience to the end user better use of data produced at the edge, right? So think about it in case of assembly line. If we are only collecting data and sending it to the to cloud for the processing, it is going to be very slow assembly line, right? <clears throat> Real-time analysis, analysis, avoid latency. We need to process the data closer to the use case or the environment, right? We don't want to uh, uh, get delayed uh, uh, propagating data to the cloud. And uh, new application style, separation of concern. So guys, uh, this is important. Um, so, I mean, if you think any application has a life cycle, every time, maybe after a year or two or three, we keep changing a little bit as far as the architecture is concerned to the, to the application. Now, because of the IoT, we are lot of, uh, lot of uh, data which is coming from the, from the environment and we need to process them right there, right? If we are going to uh, upload all the data to the cloud, we are going to clog it, right? So 
separation of concern is very important. I mean, if you can process something there and clean them uh, right there, and you just uh, propagate only the bare uh, minimum data, right? That's that's is going to be really efficient. <coughs> Good. So now. So these are the edge computing uh, uh, examples or use cases, right? How to make those edge computing use cases serverless. So in this section, I'm going to talk about open source and closed source technology available uh, <coughs> to do that, right? And it's about more function uh, uh, as a service aspect of the serverless, guys. So there are a lot of uh, open source solution available like OpenBase. There are many, okay? There are more. So these are the software which need a, a, a infrastructure and you can deploy it and you have to manage it. So this software is going to give you ability to deploy a function and integrate with the ecosystem component. And uh, so some of them has, for example, like Fizen, Fizen and Kubeless, they, uh, these are the technology which go, goes on top of Kubernetes, okay? And uh, I mean, there are some dependencies with uh, um, uh, these technology. For example, Picasso. Picasso is a is a serverless uh, function as service platform on top of OpenStack, right? So, so these are the software solution, guys. Next, uh, AWS uh, Snowball Edge. So these are hardware devices designed for the remote uh, location where you have very less or no in, uh, network connectivity. So what you do is, basically this, th these are mainly a storage device. Equipped with the Lambda, you take it, integrate with your, your uh, network, and then you define cer certain uh, function or workload there, you process there, store data there, and then physically take that to your branch office and upload it to the cloud for the deeper uh, processing. <coughs> and uh, AWS Greengrass. So AWS Greengrass is designed for edge computing, basically it is extension to the Lambda. What it does is you can deploy this piece of software closer to your, your, your environment and then you integrate your devices with this uh, 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 Greengrass interface and you process your data based on your need, right? And it has, it is a gateway to the Lambda as well. So you can process whatever you want there and you can, uh, uh, move uh, data uh, to the Lambda, uh, sorry, cloud for deeper processing. Uh, Cisco Kinetic, so I think I don't have to talk about it because there has been a lot of talk around it. But in a nutshell, Cisco Kinetic is hardware software solution from Cisco, designed for IoT and smart city. And uh, <clears throat> so this, uh, guys, I'm talking about Cisco because uh, I don't, I'm not a hardware person, I know some of the Cisco's hardware, I'm more software uh, type of person. I know these devices, that's why I'm talking about Cisco. So Cisco IOX is, the, is, the, is in the core of all the Cisco network devices. For example, ASR, ISR, Cat9K, anything. So there is, a, there is an operating system called uh, uh, IOX which is running inside it. And that operating system has a Linux inbuilt there and it has a compute and a storage, right? and customer are using these devices to deploy application or services closer to their uh, their uh, environment right uh, their edge environment and they are they are using it to process data right there right so this is the place where we can we can use the function as service uh, 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 component and we can do more out of it so right now you can run 10 static process for example uh, always on type of process but with the serverless you can do even more, right? You can re-architect your, your services in a service. I mean, I'm not saying that you can, you can uh, function as a service as a silver, silver bullet. You can remove everything. There are some processes which you don't want to transform in the function as a service way, right? But there are many which we can, you can transform. So you can have a good mix of uh, 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 always on traditional services and the function as a service, and you can achieve more out of uh, these devices. <coughs> Okay, last, uh, Cisco Hyperflex Edge. It is, it is a compute devices, UCS series kind of devices, sorry, category of devices, but it is designed for the, for, for the remote location. It, is, it has a very small form, form factor, and you can install those software, what I mentioned, uh, 
which is public uh, um, uh, available as open source you can deploy it and you can do the serverless computing along with it and other option is you can have these devices you can have a kubernetes kind of platform and you can deploy traditional and 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 and, and the function is uh, function so these are i mean these are some of the technology available in the market but there are many okay i uh, emphasize mostly on cisco because that is what i know <coughs> Okay guys, why now? This is the last slide I have, and you can take it as a, as a takeaway. So, I mean, there is always a debate like, okay, why we want to do function as a service at the edge, right? And uh, why not deploy a lot of hardware, right? So, these are the reasons. First of all, <clears throat> a rapid increase in data due to proliferation of thing, right? So we are generating a lot of data, guys, right? So from the from the IoT environment, if you are not going to process separation of concern, if you are not going to process some of the data and you are going to push all the data to the cloud, that is not the efficient way of doing things. <clears throat> data is growing faster than the compute. So that is true. We are generating much more data than before, but our compute is still not uh, yet there, right? You have to have a bigger uh, um, hardware to process the, uh, those data. So can we do more with a smaller machine or the hardware? So we have to be smart. We have to find the way to do more with the less. <clears throat> Better communication technology, guys. So now the communication between this and, and the tower, I mean, we are, we, are, we are doing a very good job there, right? We are producing a lot of data from our phone. We are taking picture and doing a lot of uh, Siri queries. So those, to process those requests and data, we need something closer to you. Otherwise, you will have bad experience. And again, since the edge, the resources at, at edge, you don't have unlimited resource. We have a limited resource. We have to use them smartly so that we can do more. Cost, space, and operation. So guys, uh, think about in case of agriculture, right? If we are saying, we are asking farmer to deploy a data center, uh, uh, at their farm, I mean, so so that we have bigger uh, 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 infrastructure to do the, uh, the processing of data. It is possible for some of the farmer, but in countries like India, I mean, where we have a, not a very rich farmer, we, we cannot ask like, okay, we are to support your uh, smart agriculture, you have to have a bigger uh, pool of resource. We cannot do that. Avoid resource burnout because if you are going to run a traditional, uh, a traditional style of service at the edge, you are keep it running whether it is in use or not. You can burn out your resource. Efficient use of util uh, uh, resource utilization, which I already talked about. So, can we do more with less resource? That and serverless or the function as a service is the answer for that. Security of edge process. I told you, uh, ephemeral processes are more secure than the traditional always on process. Finally, agile programmable edge is the key to success. So still, I mean, our, our uh, edge devices, they give you programmability, but serverless function as a service will, be, will give you better programmability. With that, I'm done, guys. If you have any question, please bring it on. If no, I'm good, thank you. And finally, thanks, I took a lot of images and content from the internet. Thank you, guys. <clears throat>